wondering um, if you could just maybe touch on the, the, the outer plan transits of 2017. That, like, if you could do that briefly, I don't know, maybe that's a little too much. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's, it's a big topic, but sure, we're, we're wide open. And it's transits, and this is transits uh, affecting everybody. Point that I, that I made uh, this morning, uh, of course, is that in the kind of astrology that we're focusing on in this class, we're concerned with the personal meaning of transits, which implies the uh, impact of a transiting position uh, on your chart. So uh, Jupiter and Uranus will be opposing each other in, in Aries Libra in the coming year. Not a rare transit with Jupiter's 12-year cycle. I, I forget the exact period of it, but it's like every decade and a half, I guess, or, or something like that, it, it will occur. And okay, well, that's going to affect everybody. But if you're a Libra with an Aries moon, you're going to be really tuned into that thing. You know, other, other, other individuals will be affected by it, but the, the, their participation in it, their relationship to it, won't be quite as underscored by their personal chart. So it's like we have the, the radio station in the sky broadcasting on a, on a certain bandwidth, and then the question, is your radio tuned to that station? And for that, you've got to look at the individual chart. So these, uh, <coughs> this is, uh, the technical term is mundane astrology. That's a real unfortunate word. It makes it seem like, oh, you know, like boring, mundane. It just, it's like mundo, the world, you know, the astrology of, of the collective and the world. As we, uh, we bring Uranus and Jupiter together, we get a sense of earthquakes and lightning bolts, you know, as the metaphor I used this morning for Uranus which is a, a rather dire sounding metaphor. It, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but an earthquake or a lightning bolt has the effect of changing the appearance of the landscape in the blink of an eye. You know, something happens really suddenly and everything is really different, rather permanently in the case of an earthquake, you know. And uh, Jupiter, well, we just explored that pretty carefully before lunch and, and the notion of, uh, of luck, but also headstrong idiocy, as we've seen, ego-inflated idiocy is available with Jupiter. In other words, we're, we're juggling a lot of possibilities right away. I've been trying to say good things and bad things about both of these pieces. And here they begin to work together. And we can find uh, unexpected, beneficial, unexpected, beneficial, I'm going to finish that sentence, unexpected, feel the Uranian DNA in that word, beneficial, feel the Jupiter DNA, in that word, unexpected, beneficial, breakthroughs, kind of back to a Uranian word. Uranus correlates with genius. There's a, a really dumb definition of genius that's very popular, and that is somebody who's like really smart. This kid is so smart, his IQ is in the genius range, you know. You can count on somebody saying that, having no understanding whatsoever of the word genius. Because there are plenty of really intelligent people whom you would never call geniuses. What genius, it's, I think it's probably pretty rare to find a stupid genius, I, I, you know, I'd admit that. but. But the, the characteristic quality of genius is the ability to look at things that everybody's been looking at and see possibilities nobody has ever seen. To think outside the box, to do what has never been done. I never thought of that, you know, kind of a response to a Uranian moment. And so genius triggering breakthrough, opportunity, creativity, now, this can operate in a lot of different ways. So I'm, I'm thinking for one example, and you get particularly the Jupiter and Libra element here. I, I'm thinking we'll, uh, we'll have some pretty interesting uh, artistic creativity. You know, I'm thinking that uh, um, the album of the year in 2017 will probably be something that people are still listening to in 2019. And it's been a little while since that's happened. So that's an encouraging idea. It's just a guess. I'm looking into the crystal ball, trying to say things that are consistent with the metaphor. And Libra 
the Venus ruled sign does bring in the idea of, of the creative breakthroughs. We, we might uh, stick the neck out a little bit further and uh, imagine uh, a new medium arising. So here, here's something that, that you could say to your teenager that would, you know, would, would really lead them to uh, respond with the famous word, awesome, you know? And that was, there was a time before video games. A time before video games. So it's like, like what did people do? Kind of fun to say it, but I've been told, I, I'm not a video gamer, but I've been told that a lot of them are getting pretty creative. I had a, a friend in, uh, in San Francisco who worked in the video game industry, and his job was uh, creating worlds. I mean, that's a pretty cool job, isn't it? It was like starships visiting other planets, and he'd, here's a world in which gravity uh, is upside down, here's a world in which time runs backwards, here's a, room in which, a, a world in which there are, are three genders. Ha, huh, that's creative. So there was a time when there were no video games. Then video games appeared and opened up a channel of creativity. What is the next channel of creativity that none of us in the room can imagine? And maybe we're going to see it in the coming year. I don't know if that's true, but it would be very consistent with these symbols. And here, all of this, I'm focusing on the, the creative, artistic side of genius. What about uh, technical <coughs> genius? What, uh, what about engineering genius? What about scientific genius. So, uh, happy fantasy. Probably not true, but will get us thinking right. That 2017 is the year in which they actually invent warp drive. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, I, I, I'm just, I, I love the choreography here. Just, I, I've got to do this. Just indulge me. You know? Engage. <laughs> John Luke Picard. You know? <laughs> That's physically impossible. You can't go faster than light. The same people who said that 125 years ago, man will never fly. But, you know, we figured it out figured it out. So will there be some breakthrough at that level? What about cold fusion, a nuclear source of energy that doesn't leave nuclear waste? Uh, you know, these are, these are things people speculate about. They're kind of at the edge of the radar screen. Nobody's figured it out yet. Are we going to see breakthroughs of that nature? All transits happen in response to evolutionary necessity. It's a notion we talked about earlier at the individual level, we see it here too. So at the collective level, at the human level here, there are tremendous needs for breakthrough at this point. There is an evolutionary necessity for human innovation to rise up and answer problems that have everybody who thinks carefully feeling kind of defeated and depressed lately. All the terrible things that the world faces. What are the answers to these questions? We may begin to see them. Now, that's, uh, that's all good news. It's all good news. But the discipline with evolutionary astrology is not to be negative, but to keep an eye on the negative. Never be afraid of talking about the shadow. And so we can have uh, headstrong idiocy, a good dark term for Uranus, interacting with egomania, overextension. Of course, I can swim across the Pacific Ocean. You know, crazy Jupiter stuff. I get really scared talking about this, just, you know, considering the direction America has taken recently, you know, might we find evidence of headstrong idiocy, overextension, etc. People betting a little too high and losing the house. One of the darkest things about Uranus, and some of this I'll probably have to repeat again tomorrow morning, uh, just to make sure all the folks in webinar land are up to speed. But when we, when we get into understanding the dark side of the planet Uranus, 
there's a, a kind of distance in it, uh, a certain coolness in it. So far, that's, that's not really dark language, but we're going to get there. Let me uh, start off compassionately. A person experiences some terrible blow. Like, for example, the cops knock on a woman's door. She immediately has a sinking feeling. And the cops tell her that her 19-year-old son was just killed in an automobile accident. Question, how long is it before she cries? See, there's our question. It's a Uranian moment. The shock. Suddenly, everything is different. The earthquake or the lightning bolt. You've just lost your son. How long before she cries? We can pretty much count on the fact that she wouldn't instantaneously connect with the emotion of grief upon hearing that news. That there would be a gap. There would be an interval. It might be two minutes. It could be weeks or months. The enormity of the thing, so large, it's pushed away. Think of the looks in people's eyes 30 seconds after the devastating earthquake. Think of the look in somebody's eyes 30 seconds after the terrorist bomb blows up. You know what their eyes look like. You know what their mouths are saying. I can't believe my eyes. Literally that phrase. This is the dissociation. This is a dimension of Uranus. Now, so far I'm not fully into shadow territory. We're, we're into a kind of complex capacity that human consciousness has when it is faced with the unthinkable to distance from it, to dissociate from it. Uranian energy, a necessary function. Soldiers came back from World War I, and everybody said, oh, they're shell-shocked. That was the word, shell-shock. Soldiers came back from World War II. Here's the height of the poetry, as far as I'm concerned. They have the thousand-yard stare. That's a really eloquent image, the thousand-yard stare, staring at something a thousand yards away, staring into space. The guys came back from Vietnam. We'd all been to college by then. So we got fancy and lost the poetry. We called it post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. Same thing. It's a Uranian phenomenon. And again, so far, not fully in the dark territory. We're simply looking in adaptation to the fact that life will sometimes dish up dark things. Now we cross the line into true darkness. We take that function, that ability to distance consciousness from the emotional content of the psyche. That's what we're talking about rigorously. All feeling held in a box outside of the conscious mind. This is the uh, signature of the psycho killer, you know, for example. The person who does not feel human feelings in response to terrible things done. What would it take to be a psycho killer, a terrorist, killing strangers at random, et cetera, et cetera? That dissociation, that coldness. Mix that with dark Jupiter, blind ambition, essentially, just blind ambition. I quote the great uh, poet Bruce Springsteen here. Poor man want to be rich. Rich man want to be king. And the king ain't satisfied until he rules everything. Mm. Yeah, that's a powerful line, really. That's Jupiter. The king's not satisfied till he rules everything. What if the king has no heart? What if the king doesn't feel? What if the king is psychiatrically dissociated. That's a pretty dangerous mess. There's Uranus, Jupiter, in its dark side. And so the world runs the risk of that kind of energy manifesting, along with the possibility of these breakthroughs. Let me uh, use this as a launching pad for a slightly broader point. Um, when, when we're looking at individuals, 
like one person at a time. There, each individual may have a complex reaction to a given transit and will maybe get some of the taste of the darker side, some of the brighter. But basically one individual is, is, is sooner or later going to make a commitment. You know, I'm going to get this right, I'm going to get it wrong, here's the path I'm going to take. It's one person, one life, the, the finitude of one life. But when we're looking at mundane astrology, we're looking at things that apply to everybody. Well, uh, there's seven billion of us on the planet now. Each individual responding to Uranus opposite Jupiter or whatever else we might be looking at, each individual responding in his or her own way. Some people responding beautifully. There will be geniuses. There will be the megalomaniacal, kind of psychotic, dangerous people. Some of them might be heads of government. Some of them might be at the head of the dinner table in a, in a little town in Kansas City or something, or Kansas State. They, they can take a lot of forms, but we will get all of these possibilities. In mundane astrology, you see it all. It's all there. there. We may kind of average it out and get a sense of humanity past that test or flunk this test, but always the diversity will be there. That's one of the major differences between looking at individuals and looking at collectives. With the collectives, you see everything. It, it's all manifest. It looks like pretty colorful year. Keeping perspective, which is critical here. The uh, Uranus with its, as I mentioned this earlier, with its 12-year orbit forming aspects, or, or pardon me, Jupiter with its 12-year orbit forming aspects to to Uranus opposition in this case is not a rare thing. You know, we, we, we see it quite commonly, repetitively. It's not as important as uh, some of the bigger, slower things that have been happening. Uh, astrologers no longer say very much about the Pluto-Uranus square, you know, which was peaking a few years ago. But, uh, you know, with Pluto today in about 16 degrees of Capricorn, Uranus in like, you know, 20, 22, something like that, that square is still in effect. That's still happening. So, uh, are the conservatives and the liberals still kind of not getting along, you know? In a way, it seems like it's gotten worse. That's a, that's a bigger thing. That's going to be fading over the next little while. I think I'm already kind of seeing the handwriting on the wall because now that the conservatives have won, they'll begin to argue among themselves and we'll begin to see some fragmentation. And I think some of the polarization that has been so stable will begin to break down. That's my guess. Not exactly a prediction of an age of peace, love, and understanding, but, you know, a change in the political climate. I press a little further. Probably, from my point of view, the most important thing that is happening now at, at the level of mundane astrology is the passage of Neptune through Pisces. I would never want to talk about the present times without including that. Now, Neptune is always in a sign, but when it's in Pisces, it takes on a tremendous amount of power. So it's like all of humanity is going through a major Neptune transit now. Everybody's chart, Neptune is in it somewhere, and it's broadcasting a little more powerfully. So once again, to prophesy the spiritual renaissance, that's never worked very well. That hasn't happened. I prefer to work with little images. So I'm, I'm thinking, I bet these are true stories. They may not be factual, but they're true. I've got a neo-Nazi skinhead driving down the road, you know, driving kind of dangerously, cutting people off, just generally driving like you'd expect a neo-Nazi skinhead to drive. Meanwhile, he's stabbing at the radio dial, stabbing at the, at the buttons, you know, as he drives. He wants, wants to hear some, some, some real gangster music, angry, pissed off music, and he hits the wrong button. It's Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And for 17 seconds, this neo-Nazi skinhead is transported. Whoa. And then after 17 seconds, he remembers himself. See, it was Neptune. He forgot doing the neo-Nazi skinhead script. He forgot it. 
for 17 seconds and he's lifted into the ethers by Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Then 18 seconds, he wrote, oh, I hate this shit. He punches the other button, back, back to being a neo-Nazi skinhead. But what just happened? What just happened for 17 seconds? The murderous drug lord, or a coyote as we say here, the guy sneaking people across the border, often, often they die, they're left out in the desert, you know, cold-hearted stuff. This, uh, this coyote or, or murderous drug dealer gazes up at the Milky Way for 10 seconds, transported, Neptune, a Neptune moment and then back to doing what he's doing. These, I, I like these little stories, these little images. Multiply them by seven billion. Multiply them by seven billion. Even these people who are uh, not very advanced on the spiritual path, we might say, based on the descriptions I've given, even them, even them. As William Butler Yeats put it, there is not a soul that lacks a sweet crystalline cry. Isn't that a beautiful line? Not a soul that lacks a sweet crystalline cry. What about uh, folks such as ourselves, far more evolved spiritually, right? <laughs> well, we probably are, or we wouldn't be in this room. And we're all meditating 5% more, 10% more. See the incremental sense of it? Neptune entered Pisces in 2011, went back into Aquarius back into Pisces beginning of 2012, February of 12th. I got my copy of Time Magazine, right as Neptune was re-entering Pisces. Front cover, what if there is no hell? Time Magazine. An evangelist uh, theologian had, had gone into a very Neptunian place. What if God's love is so infinite? He wouldn't actually leave anybody to be tortured in hell for the rest of eternity. What if God were capable of that level of forgiveness? And of course the rest of the evangelists, no, no, we need hell. What if somebody <laughs> masturbates, you know, and all, all of that, you know? <laughs> what about gay people, you know? You know how that, but, but cover of Time magazine. I mean, the, the point is that as Neptune entered Pisces, the synchronistic manifestation is a news magazine ran a deeply metaphysical story as their cover story. I mean, I've never met anybody who had this, the following two characteristics. They didn't believe in astrology and they knew a damn thing about it, you know? They paid any attention to it. You start looking and there it is, you know, like that story. This new pope, Neptune in Pisces, with with all that he is meant. We're in a spiritual awakening now. Whenever Neptune goes into Pisces, that's happened. I'm, I'm gonna be careful, I get real excited about this. I could talk too long about it. I promise I'm gonna do two more minutes and then I'm gonna shut up, take another question. But it's important to know it. Neptune went into Pisces, it's the story of the New Testament in the Bible. If you grow up in a church, you know, the Gospels, Jesus on the earth, that's Neptune and Aquarius. In uh, 45 AD, St. Paul went to the seven churches of Asia, practically got his ass kicked. 47 AD, Neptune went into Pisces, and they started listening. And basically the story of New Testament outside the Gospels is the story of Neptune and Pisces. Neptune entered Pisces in the early 8th century, and Islam spread from the Pyrenees, Spain, France border, all the way across North Africa, all the way across the Near East, the Middle East, all the way to Indonesia in about a decade and a half. Amazing. I like to add, before Facebook, you know, how, how, how did that happen? But suddenly everybody was ready in that part of the world. Islam was the metaphor, just like Christianity, Christianity was the metaphor. Buddhism came to China. Wow, if you're interested in Buddhism, what a moment that is, you know. Buddhism came to China, Neptune and Pisces. A couple of cycles later, Buddhism came to Japan. Christianity, you know, got stiff and boring and dead. Neptune went into Pisces, Martin Luther's nail in the 95 Theses to the church door at Wittenberg, the Protestant Reformation. People turned to it. Middle of the 19th century, for a decade and a half or so, Neptune in Pisces. One little piece there. 
So piece of American history you don't learn in history class. Population of America, 1850, more or less 23 million people. Of those 23 million people, 11 million were members of spiritualist churches. Now the spiritualist churches, absolutely fundamental to them, was communication with the so-called dead. Communication with your Uncle Harry from the other side through mediumship and so on. Whatever you think of it, just the sociological phenomenon of almost half the population of America, you know, tuned in in that way. Neptune in Pisces. Seances in the White House, literally. Abraham Lincoln. Wow. And here we are in it again. What does the fish know of the sea? But this renaissance is trying to happen. Of all the things I would talk about, about 2017, this is the most fundamental one, as far as I'm concerned. Everything else, there's a lot of tension in the other things, but this is the underlying breakthrough that's happening. I wouldn't be surprised a new religion arises. I wouldn't be surprised a new messiah is born, or, you know, master teacher, or becomes active. It's the kind of thing we expect under the banner of Pisces. So that's why we're all here, probably. Not just in this room, learning these techniques, but also on the earth now. It's no accident. We're here. We're part of it. We're all part of it. Even the neo-Nazi skinhead. So good question. I kind of ran with it.